Okay, it's done. So the idea behind ACP scheduler started back in the 2003 or four with people going, why don't you let ACP stop? And then when the weather clears, restart. Well, so when you restart, all your targets are further out to the west. What should you do? Where should you restart? Where in the in the plan? It's not easy. Once you start down that path, you end up with something that is a scheduler and you you can't avoid it. So I went the whole hog way and went out and studied what was available on the internet. Then I discovered the Liverpool Telescope had done something like this, and I studied their paper, came back, sat down and decided, okay, what am I going to do here? The whole idea is for this scheduler to do what it needs to do at that time and not try to go back and look at anything in the past or anything else. So I came up with the idea of... of um, uh, um, constraints, which are the conditions under which you want your stuff to be observed. And then no matter what, it looks at everything in, well, okay, I'll back up and say, you can put observing in there, re observing requests for the next year if you want. And there are people with thousands of objects and plans in their scheduler that extend at least over a year. It will look at the entire thing that's there decide what it can do now based on those constraints or the conditions. Obviously, things that are underground that are not even visible right now, it throws those out. It throws things out that are below the horizon, outside the hour angle, outside the air mass, all of that. It looks at everything there is to do and then decides what it can do. Now it has a set of things that it can do, and here's the magic sauce in the scheduler. The next thing it does is decides what it should do. And I can explain some of that, but if you want to know what that detailed uh, decision process is all about, you can go, and I have put a uh, link in the comm center um, on the, uh, let me go over here to my desktop, Actually, I think I can probably show you here. Yeah. Um, this is the announcement here for the Wednesday night program. And if you go to the communications center, uh, yep, it didn't show up. Anyway, I thought I had put a uh, link on there. I will, as soon as I finish, to this paper. Okay. This is, this is also included with your scheduler help but it describes the whole uh, decision process, how it all works, and the key being the, the efficiency function that you see. That's what is at the heart of the decision by scheduler as to what it should do next, which is what I was saying before. So that... Once, once it has everything that it can do, it says, okay, what should I do? And it will go start that. And what I mean by start that is it will take that request, uh, the first request of a plan, and send it to ACP. ACP will start observing. There's a lot more to this than I can cover in 20 minutes, but this is basically the, the cycle of operation. It, it will look at everything that's out there, Decide what it can do, decide what it should do, do it. Go back and look at everything out there again. Decide what it can do, decide what it should do, do it. When you do that, there's a lot of magic sauce that has to go into this because you may have thousands and thousands of requests and you have to evaluate every one of them to decide which ones you can and should do. So that's basically, in a nutshell, what the scheduler does. It eliminates for you when you don't have to make any decisions as to when to observe something. Is it up? Is it good? Is the weather good? Is the sky con condition good? Is it within the air mass I need? I need to get these um, reference stars within certain air mass ranges. Is that star there now? No, yes. Okay, so it does a heck of a lot of work to um, improve your observatory's productivity.
So what I was going to do is explain to you a couple of subtleties on this that came up uh, back in 2004 and five. A guy named John Farrell, who was was is a retired uh, Los Alamos guy and um, was doing photometry, he was one of my very early scheduler customers and was just banging away on taking data on various things. And um, he said, you know, there's a big problem with this. When my targets rise above the minimum or the let's say the minimum altitude that I've set, let's say I want to get this data at or above 40 degrees elevation. So now the target rises, it hits 40 degrees elevation, boom, the scheduler goes out and starts it. Well, you know, really, it could be um, acquired at a higher altitude. I don't have that much work in the scheduler, but it always starts stuff right when it comes within the constraints. It really should maybe wait a little while and um, acquire the data later. And I thought, yeah, that's not a bad idea. So the outcome of that was a thing which I call rising plan delay. And that's described in the paper that I showed you. And I'll give you a little idea of what this looks like in the real world. Okay, without rising plan delay, this is a this is a um, this is a scatter or a, a a diagram produced by a tool. Which, if you want me to uh, uh, to tell you how to use that, it's it's actually described in ACP Help, but it's also I need to scrunch this down just a little bit. Sorry, guys, um, so that it can fit there. This tells you, this is just a test, a set of test targets. And without the rising plan delay, here's what it looks like uh, through the night. Click. Okay. And what am I doing here? Minus, minus. Okay. This is a chart of where the targets are acquired with respect to the meridian. Uh, a negative um, hour angle is to the east. And you can see that it's starting to grab the targets just as soon as they come into uh, in within the constraints. This is what he was complaining about. I could get this data in much better conditions, but you're starting it the minute that it could be started. Um, if somebody has a question on what kind of a mixture of targets this is, it's a combination of asteroid targets, which are four images spaced by 20 minutes apart, and single images as well. Anyway, if you compare that, so what the rising plan delay does is it looks at what's what work is sitting there and it decides whether or not it can let this target continue to rise. And it will do that until it gets up near the meridian and then it'll start to acquire it. Even though it met constraints maybe an hour or two beforehand, it will continue to let the target rise and the outcome of that, the result of that is you get something like this. And if you can see that the difference here, look how close to the meridian, which means look how low the air mass is that the targets are acquired. This is just done by simply letting the targets rise and acquiring them when they get near the meridian instead of acquiring them the minute they meet constraints. It's a very subtle issue, but boy, it really helped. Now, for you astro imagers out there, this isn't going to help that much because you have long plans that run an hour or as little as a half an hour. You're not going to notice much difference. But people doing science, you'll benefit from this. The reason people don't like it is they they start using the, the scheduler early and then they go, well, why isn't observing my stuff? It's in constraints. Scheduler's broken. I don't get it. I go, okay, well, turn off the rising plan delay and you'll, it'll act like you think it should. And then eventually when people start going, I can come back to them and say, okay, now that you're used to the scheduler, maybe turn this back on because look at the benefits. So that's John Farrell's really cool thing from uh, um, 2006. Now, 
in February, um, in, in no, in January, one of my Astro Imaging customers, Peter Prendergast, said, you know what? I have a real problem. Uh, let me bring up um, a uh, some pictures that will help you understand what I'm talking about here. All right. This is a set of uh, of targets that I set up as a as a semi realistic test. Well, maybe I can fit this into the Chrome thing. Yeah, that's good. All right. And what's happening is that the scheduler is nipping at each of these targets a little bit at a time. If you look at the completion here, you'll see there's 20%, 10% that it's it's doing what it needs to do. It's getting the data in as best of conditions as it can, but none of the projects are getting completed. So he ends up with lots and lots of different projects that are being worked on night after night after night, but each one of the projects is just getting, you know, a few images and a half hour here, a half hour there. So it's going to take a long time for these projects to complete. And being an astro imager, he would like to have a completed project, 40 hours on some object, 20 hours on some object. He'd like to have that so he can start doing the processing and create his art. So he asked, what could I do? And it all started, this whole thing started as a discussion um, where did I put that? Oh, project completion. There it is. This is started on the comm center as a discussion. Is there any way to determine tonight's schedule if it has gaps? And this went on and on and on. The discussion continued and Eventually, I was able to zero in on what people really wanted to do. And the net result is that instead of this, I put in a thing called project completion. And what that does is, let me see my time, 6.15, we're doing well. And I will take uh, questions. So please, if you have questions, please post them to the chat and I will take them. But I know I'm going 100 miles an hour now, and this is being recorded and we'll live in um, perpetuity on the channel for people to understand how this works. But I will take questions, so please come up with one or two, maybe. If you look here, after the project completion change that was put in, look, now it's completing projects, but there's no such thing as a free lunch. If What happens is ACP will look at a project and it will see that it's starting to be worked on. And the closer it gets to completion, the more the scheduler will focus on that project and not do other projects. And it will do so at the expense of working up in the low, up in the high sky again. So if you look at what happens without, with, um, I'm sorry, with project just normally, the scheduler would work on Peter's projects and, and acquire data always as close to the meridian as possible. What this means is that you're looking through the least amount of air, the least amount of turbulence, and getting the highest quality data. But if you want to get those projects completed, you have to give up something. So what you give up is that. Instead, the scheduler will work over a much wider range, but it will try and complete those projects whether or not the, the data is acquired near the meridian. So this is, again, as I said, it's subtle, but the net result, the feedback from Peter was that it's just fantastic. He totally loves it. And it's uh, something I never would have expected, but in, in other words, I didn't anticipate it as a design thing, but and there are other people who also said that. And if you want to, you can go back and look at uh, this this uh, com center thread again, and you'll see how that kind of uh, progressed. Now I'm a little bit surprised because I thought I had put a copy of the scheduler paper here. Apparently, I didn't push 
post or something. You have it. If you're a if you're an ACP scheduler uh, or ACP expert licensee, it's already in your documentation. And on the link here, when I say episode four has aired, you'll see that I'll add a link to that paper, which describes the subtle details of the scheduler. Okay, well, I've talked for almost 20 minutes, and for that, I apologize. Um, the floor is open. If there are people with questions, please ask. Otherwise, um, we'll let this one uh, go into uh, history, and we'll do another one in a few weeks. We are going, I should give you a little bit of news, we're going to go to Northern California. I will be at the Sierra Remote Observatory in uh, next week. And then the following week, I, I'm going to check to see if I can do this, but we may do another uh, live broadcast. But on Sunday, the 26th, yes, the 27th, Sunday, the 27th, I will be on the Astro Imaging channel and talking about ACP and Pinpoint. They asked me actually to talk about plate solving, which I will do first. And then um, after that, I'll, uh, you know, it's I'll be on there for an hour. So I'll have lots of time to talk about all the things we're doing, the projects we're doing, and so forth. Okay, it's been 20 minutes. That's about what uh, this program was supposed to last. So if you liked it, please click subscribe on uh, the, the channel. Um, and also the little bell icon next to the subscribe icon. I can probably bring that up fairly quickly. Uh, let's see. My channel would be right here. When you're looking at stuff. Yeah, right there like that. Subscribe okay. on... Uh, All the right, well, I don't have uh, I don't have that button because I'm already subscribed, so... Anyway, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell icon, uh, click that too, so you'll get um, a notification. And um, I'll open the 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 uh, channel for anybody who has any questions right now. Please say hi or ask a question. I'm I'll be I'll stay here as long as I can as long as I need to to answer your questions. If you have uh, questions you don't want to ask on the chat line then um, please feel free to post them to the DC3 Dreams Communication Center. I always answer questions there. I'm in and out of there at least twice a day. So again, subscribe to the channel. Go to uh, the Astro Imaging channel, T-A-I-C. You can look that up on YouTube. It's easy. It jumps right at the top of your search. The Astro Imaging channel. I'll be there on the 27th. So thank you again. Um, I hope you all enjoyed this and learned something from it. And we'll see you in a week or two.